Hey, hey, Jake J here with another episode of Field Notes for Play. Today we're talking about VA 11 Hall A, or rather Valhalla, because I don't want to spell that out every single time I reference the game. We'll just call it Valhalla. So when I started playing Valhalla, I found this dialogue box particularly entertaining and helpful. This game is best played getting comfortable. Grab some drinks, some snacks, and enjoy. Sukeban Games, I assume that's how it's pronounced, apologies if it's not, Sukeban Games says they want you to have a good time, and that's a pretty nice sentiment, but honestly, the more I play this game, the more I think that this is, at least in part, an artifice. I think Sukeban Games does want you to enjoy their game, but I also think they want you to be critical of how the game is presented, because this world, the sad world surrounding Valhalla, is our world. This future is our future. The characters of this universe, as we do, exist between two realities. The one we live every day and the one that we are forcibly asked to comply with. Ah, that sounds really dark, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't really have a response to that. Valhalla has you playing as a bartender, Jill, who lives both an interesting and not so interesting life. She lives from paycheck to paycheck in a reality where everything is crazy expensive. Like, who's paying $200 for a drink? Well, people in this universe, of course. You, via Jill, interact with bar patrons, make them drinks, interact some more, learn about their lives, make them more drinks, and then suddenly they're gone. The narrative in the game depends on the drinks you serve, although you don't often have much of a choice on what to serve them. Okay, before we go any further, I just want to say that I think the narrative in this game is awesome. I couldn't find very many analyses about the narrative, which honestly is a little surprising and disappointing. However, I, I'm not going to be talking about the narrative today, maybe some other time. But instead, I'm going to focus on the mechanics of the game and how those mechanics make the experience of Valhalla more believable. Alright, so here's the game loop. You start the game off at home. Using your phone, you can read articles and forum posts about interesting things happening in the city and around the world. You can save or load your game using, hilariously enough, an app called Life Backup 1.1. Jill also talks to her cat, although you don't really have many interactions there. So when you're ready, you go to work. And here you have control over the jukebox and the... Well, that's about it. You talk to your coworker Gil, your boss Dana, and the clientele who frequent your establishment. Most clients describe the bar as not a great place to be. It's gross, it's smelly, it's dingy. As you talk to the bar patrons, you make them drinks. Sometimes you have control over what goes into that drink, but usually you just follow a recipe. There's not any time limit to make the drinks. You can reset the recipe as many times as you'd like while you prepare it. There's a recipe book to follow. There's not really any pressure to the drink making process, which supports the dialogue that you see at the beginning of the game. You're given one break during your shift, which gives you an opportunity to save your game again. And then it's back to talking with the bar goers. Once you go home at the end of the night, the loop repeats. Valhalla's mechanics provide you with very little agency. I think you have two real possibilities for choice. You can choose how much media to consume. You decide how many articles to read, what channel the TV is on, and what music gets played through the night. These choices are mostly about your game experience and probably don't play much of a part in the outcome of the narrative. You also have some agency over what drinks to serve. For the most part, customers will ask for specific drinks, but every once in a while, they give you some leeway to make subtle changes. The drinks you choose decide what direction the narrative goes, but you have no real way of knowing how your choice will affect the story, save for following the walkthrough. Jill? Jill doesn't seem to have much of an effect on the world. She doesn't help save people when two cars crash outside the building. She doesn't actually change Donovan Dawson's mind when she's complaining to him about sensationalized hacker stories. She doesn't even clean up after the corgis in the bathroom. Gil does it for her. That's not to say that Jill is unimportant. She has minor effects on all of these people. But I don't think we could rightfully put her into the hero's journey, given the contents of this story. Jill exhibits very little control over the reality she inhabits, and depending on your preferences, chooses to obscure her lack of control by consuming media that is intended to change her perception of reality. She speaks with customers who seem to have far more control over their lives, but as she talks with them, she learns that they don't really. 
everyone answers to someone. Everyone she encounters is just trying to reach a balance between the dichotomy I spoke of earlier, between their personal reality and the reality being sold to them. In other words, the corporations want people to be happy and complacent. However, the world is actually crap, in part because of those same corporations, and people live somewhere in the middle. I don't actually think that Valhalla is a bartending simulator, as some gaming outlets describe it. I think it's more accurately described as a modern life simulator. Many of us don't achieve our dreams, or even have dreams to begin with. Many of us struggle between the world we see in front of us and the world described to us by the media. Jill feels the same. The mechanics of Valhalla give us very little control, but they give us enough to realize that living here in the world of Valhalla is not good or bad. It just is. There's a line in the beginning of The Truman Show, just after, all right, spoiler alert, Truman discovers things are a bit weird where he lives. Kristoff, Truman's adopted father and architect of The Truman Show, is asked why it took Truman so long to start asking questions. He answers, we accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. If Valhalla has taught me anything, it's that we should accept the reality of the world, but we should also seek to find peace in it. Also, why didn't they show us the corgis with the tuxedos? What was that about? I want to see that. Give me pictures. All right, friends, that'll do it. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, I wish I hadn't done that. Questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, put those down in the place where those sorts of things go. Opinions about my schedule, you leave those down there too. This week I'm going to be doing a double feature, so to speak. This obviously was Field Notes for Play, but also uh, Friday's episode is going to be Field Notes for Play. I'm just sort of playing around with the, uh, with the schedule, see what I like, what I don't like. And then suddenly I have nothing to say. Subscribe if you want. You can also follow me on Twitter if you want. All that information is down there, maybe over there, or over there, whichever direction. Um, and I will talk to you folks in a minute. Not a real minute. Just a metaphorical sort of slang kind of minute. Whatever. Bye.